back in. <laughs> well, that there's your difficulty right there. <laughs> I gave it to a friend and he's like, they're great. So um, can I have another one? I don't want to take them all. I'm like, oh, it's fine. <laughs> you can have okay, another one. So we're live, but we're I'm quiet cutting and pasting. Quiet okay. Quiet chords from your guitar. Floating on the silence that surrounds us. Quiet thoughts and quiet dreams. Quiet walks by quiet streams. And a window that looks out on Corcovado. Oh, how lovely. This is where I want to be. Here with you, so close to me Until the final flicker of life's ember I who was lost and lonely Believing life was only A bitter, tragic joke Have found with you track from the video or the new track that was the old track right that was from your um, from your email oh so I thought it sounded like the new track but the old the, the video because I can't figure out how to pop out the old vocal from that video and pop in the new vocal which um that's Dory Amarillo of course on guitar and um we recorded at his studio quickly because I was doing um a radio interview and I, I don't have a cd so I needed some tracks so that was recorded in his fabulous studio and he's quick <laughs> yeah he is. so but before we get into dory amarillo <clears throat> which we could talk about for a long time um we'll talk about you and ladies and gentlemen <laughs> da, 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 carrie kelsey <laughs> fabulous woohoo well, thank you. That's nice to hear. I'm glad somebody thinks so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, people are lining up here on the comments. So I guess apparently oh, okay. Tom Clark Hill. Oh, oh, <laughs> oh, that's to me. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> that's okay. I was going to say I don't know him, but hi, <laughs> Tom Clark Hill. <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> there's Aviva. There's Nora. There's Jamie Templeton. Oh, uh, Aldrich, Jody Jarris. I'm sure people are gonna come on a lot. Nice. Well, I told them I might be talking about them, so they should show up to hear. <laughs> <laughs> That'll always do it, right? <laughs> Gotta be careful about what I'm saying, so they're coming to check it out. <laughs> <laughs> so, care. You know, this is good because um, even though 
<clears throat> like most people, you know, we, we see each other, we hang out, we'll have a glass of wine, a few laughs, we'll sing, you know. But a two-hour conversation, it doesn't really happen very it much. It doesn't ever in real life, does it? No, not really. We used to do that on the phone. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody does that anymore. Oh, <laughs> you know, I remember the first girl I was, I had a long conversation with. I was in, you know, elementary school. And I just remember... I thought it was just the best thing ever. <laughs> it is. We had a really long conversation. I was so impressed, you know. It's fine. You know what cured me of that was being a literary agent. And um, when I used to hear better out of both ears, I would have one on hold and be on the phone with the other. And then um, I would come home and not want to even hear the word phone. You know, that was sort of like the end of my having long conversations. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. So you were a literary agent. Though. I didn't know that. So yeah, how, seven and a half years. Oh, my God. Yep. And so um, when was when was that? And did you did you study that in college? I mean, did you study writing? Or? No. In fact, I used to always think um, they're going to figure out I'm a fraud at some point because um, I, I literally, we moved here and my ex-husband um, was from the circus. I was married to a trapeze artist. Um, not nearly as exciting as it sounds, but it was a lot of fun, you know, the traveling with the circus. And and then he wanted to do stunts, which was at that time stunts, people that did stunts came from three worlds, um, car racing, cowboys, like horse riders, and uh, circus people because they had the aerial skills. And so we came out here and um, to get his career going. And in the meantime, somebody needed to um, make sure that we had the rent paid to keep the roof over our head because my son was little. And um, so this was early 90s, I guess. Anyway, when he finished school, I signed up for that temp agency. Do you remember there was a temp agency that worked with only entertainment companies? Maybe. And so they called me and said, um, I we have a job for you at CAA. And I said, great, what's CAA? And they're like, only the biggest agency in town. Well, I had no idea. I had this big dual cab truck with four doors and dual wheels that I couldn't really drive very well. And um, so we only had one car and my ex went to drop me off. It wouldn't even fit in the garage. <laughs> and um, that day I worked for a literary agent and it was during that big strike, you know, the first big writer strike. So literally all I did was read a magazine. I answered the phone. I heard them talking about Madonna opening on Broadway and their tickets, yada, yada, yada. And the girl next to me worked for a packaging agent. And she he came out and said, you know, this show just got picked up. I need to send the same flowers and stuff that you sent to that person. And I thought, oh, glad I don't have to do that. I don't even know where a flower shop is. And she looked at me halfway through the day and said, would you like my job? Um, I'm leaving to become a realtor and I think you'd be perfect. And I'm like, what are you going by the way I answered the one phone call or <laughs> the way I read my magazine? <laughs> because there was nothing to do during the strike. And I thought, oh, no. I mean, there were people crying in the bathroom. It was, I couldn't figure out why the mail people were so friendly. I didn't know the system at all. I didn't know that they worked up from the mail department. So um, I said, no, thank you. And the next day, I went to work for this small literary agency that's still around called Montero Rose Agency. They had these beautiful lamps. It was very homey. As a mother, I knew this was more a place for me because if I needed to, I could you know, go home or bring my son. It was much closer to where I lived. It was in Encino. And so I started temping for them all during the strike. They represented animated writers and they were told right when they started their company, there's gonna be a strike, put your little war chest away they believed them and did that and never once had to dip into it because animated writers weren't affected and she was the first agent for animated writers candy montero they called her the union so um when they when the strike was over they looked at me and said would you they heard me on the phone one day negotiating a car to buy and after that they said would you like to take over our television department and so because they had gotten really busy with features during the strike they told all their writers write that feature you know you have in you you can't do anything else right now. And they started really taking off in the feature world. So I did that. Um, it was never something I aspired to. I, one of our, my, my one boss had been in business affairs, Fred Rose, and the other one had been an English major. So I'm like, what am I doing here? I was a theater arts major. And then I realized 
I read the scripts completely differently than they do. I read stage direction, which a lot of the jokes were in the stage direction. They, most people skip over that. So I realized I did have something to offer and bring to the table. And, um, so I, and I'd watched a lot of television as a kid, which my mother hated and it ended up paying off. So, <laughs> so I did that, but it was frustrating because in television, especially there's such ageism, which I've hated since I was a child, you know, and so that was hard to get past because they, the network executives don't like anybody younger than them. I mean, older than them working for them. But I kept thinking, why don't you take this guy who used to work with, you know, on happy days with Gary Marshall and put him in because he knows how to do an A and a B story and hire the 20 year old for the conversation and the lingo and stuff that you want and to be up on the trends but mix them together you know i couldn't understand it so it, it frustrated me <laughs> yeah but i did that for a long time so you you ended up in that on that in that job that you were yep. just so i took over and they you know like i had been temping literally the whole time and so they hired me from the temp agency i stayed a little while as their assistant and then went into doing that so it was fun. It was before computers. I couldn't even get them to use the intercom. We used carbon paper. <laughs> <laughs> I would have to go in with a note and say, hey, so-and-so's on the phone. And I didn't know anything. You know, I remember the guy who created Taxi called them like, oh, I'm sorry, they're in a meeting. They came out and saw his name and they're like, Gary, you know, you always interrupt us for that. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I didn't know who he was. <laughs> so now they're trying to get him back on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> So what made you uh, stop? Um, I just, it was never something I really wanted to do to begin with. What I wanted to do was be home with my son. So the minute I was able to do that, that's what I did. And I became room mother um, every year after that. <laughs> <laughs> and I never missed anything. I was close enough, you know, that I could get out and go to like the concert at school or whatever. But But that's all I was interested in doing, you know, was being home with him. <laughs> instead of coming home, doing the homework, getting the lunch ready, taking him to school the next day, you know, instead of all of that, I just, I wanted to have some of the, you know, fun time too. Yeah, yeah. And you were married at that time? Yes, married for a very long time. Yeah. Was that the circus guy or no? Yeah, that was him. My, my one and only marriage so far. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I've actually come across circus, the circus or, um, uh, community. And I just think they're fascinating. They're fun. You yeah. know, I mean, every job is a job, you know, and it has its, I learned that from my husband, Gary, right? You know, when I went to see him first, I thought, oh, I'm NBC and it's behind the scenes and he's working on the Tonight Show. You know, I was, is really alluring, you know, but then I find out it's just, you know, the politics in the side are the same and, you know, it's a, it's a job every day you go and, you know, but. Wait, what did Gary do? I didn't know this. He was a lighting board director on the Tonight Show. Oh, how cool. He With Johnny other, Carson and Jay Leno or. Uh, just to, uh, at the end of Johnny Carson, mostly with Jay Leno for like over 20 years. Oh my gosh, that is so cool. Yeah. That is very neat. And he did other lighting, you know, before, earlier, you know, like on live shows and uh, mm -hmm. bigger, bigger shows. Country Nights or whatever that was called. Country. I can't, I can't remember. remember. Yeah, me yeah. either. Anyway, you know, but it was, it was fun because it was unusual for me, right? And it's also entertainment, it's behind the scenes, you get to see, you know, and you feel like you're part of something, right? Yes, well, it's fascinating. Yeah, All yeah. It, learning, I mean, anything new that you can learn something about is always fascinating, I think. Yeah. And the, the circus, I mean, I had seen one in my life and it was Ringling Brothers, it was Three Rings, I hated it. Um, and I was living in New York and the Big Apple Circus, which is very well known there, um, was there and my friend was selling tickets and I had moved across town and New York, you know, people will go from first to 110th, but they're not going to cross town to see you. So I was <laughs> lonely. I had gone from 85th to 72nd. My friend lived in Queens and he didn't care because he had to come in from Queens. He would come visit. And I said, where are you? You know, it's lonely. I don't see you. And he said, oh, I'm working at the circus selling tickets. Why don't you come visit? I go, Ugh, what am I gonna do at the circus? <laughs> he said, well, Jose is here, who is my now brother-in-law, but we had been really good friends in college. 
And I said, what is Jose doing at the circus? And he said he does PR for his family. And I'm like, okay, what does his family do? <laughs> he said, they're trapeze artists. I'm like, get out of here. How could I go to school with this guy all this time and not know that? And um, so I went up to visit and that night we all went to dinner and it was the coolest thing. It was like this tent right in Damrush Park, right next to the Met. And um, they invited me to come back to this gala. And um, there were like a lot, you know, soap stars, celebrities. It was a, like a hundred dollars a ticket, which was a lot at the time. And they said, come back, you know, as our guest. And I thought, eh, free dinner and dancing. I love dancing. I have to sit through the circus, but that's okay. And um, I saw the trailer row, which fascinated me. I just have this, like, I was in awe of trailers. When I opened it, it looked, it was bigger than my New York apartment. So I'm like, this is the best. <laughs> and um, I think I just fell in love with that right away. And then I went into, I opened the door and met my, my, you know, soon to be ex-husband was standing there <laughs> and um, not soon to be, but, and, and, um, we hit it off right away and he walked me into the show it was one ring european style it was a lot like theater and i fell in love with the show the way they changed places on the pedestal was the most fascinating gorgeous thing i'd ever seen i'd rather see them do that or do one somersault than somebody else do four and um it was just and we that was right after thanksgiving and we got married in April. I lie and say it was six months, but it wasn't. But you know, when you know the family, you kind of cut through all that. Is anybody in your family a mass murderer stuff? <laughs> so you kind of <laughs> feel like you know them. <laughs> so it was quick. And the next thing you know, I'm traveling with the circus going, oh. And my ex said <laughs> that we were lucky that it was like the, the Mercedes of circuses because some circuses, you know, they'll go do two or three shows pack up that night, move to the next place, do two or three shows. We stayed, um, well, we were at Lincoln Center the whole time at, at Christmas time and through the holidays, Thanksgiving through January, and then um, the boroughs in the New England area. But we stayed a week in each place. If it was too far away, we had a whole day to move. It was like luxurious circus. So it was fun. And it's pretty, I mean, so, uh, you know, some of those, like the aerialists, I mean, shit, man it's pretty amazing you know what they it's terrifying can, yeah yeah and they're so and they just they learn it and they do it and they're good at it and it's it's beautiful to watch yeah it's really pretty amazing isn't it and true circus is generations you know people yeah. that they, my he was fourth third or fourth generation circus wow. but with anything else the more you know about it the more fearful i became to the point that i could only watch the shadows on the tent until he caught and came back. Then I would watch on the pedestal. You see a few things happen that are scary. We didn't have, we had one elephant, but we didn't really have animals. It was more like sort of Cirque du Soleil style. But um, I remember going to other shows and the elephants doing that thing where they stand on each other's back across the way. And two people like jumped up and ran to the back of the bleachers. And I'm like, these are people that have been in the circus all their life. What are they doing? They've seen an elephant have a heart attack and fall over and there's nothing you could do if you're on the front row. I mean, they don't mean to hurt you. They're just big. So, I, I mean, the more I learned, the more I was like, okay, I'm gonna just stay over here. Because <laughs> ignorance is bliss, definitely, when it comes to those kind of things. But anyway, it was, it was a great, great experience. Wow. And, you know, the guys that started Big Apple were, um, they were street jugglers in Europe and and they started it. So it was really cool. Do you, did you know Yolanda Rodriguez? No, no I don't uh, think so. Maybe my family does. Well, no, I didn't know. Uh, she's a singer. Oh, okay. She would have come over to the Gardenia, but um, she moved down south a little bit. But uh, she introduced me to this Jewish guy who's a circus guy in, in L.A. And they would have these parties in their backyard, and he had all the <laughs> he had stuff set up so that they could jump around. And Gary Morgan, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I I never remembered his name. Mm -hmm. I wa I'd love to interview him because he was really fun, and he did a show um, uh, down by the beach. There's the um, that area where. You can go and watch a show. Oh, right. The outside area. One of our, our singers, Gary Kaplan, goes there. They do that, like right by Muscle Beach or something, I think. Yeah, yeah. 
So anyway, but he but he was really good, and the people were. It was just it felt good to be around those people. You know, was he? Did he have a house way at the top of a hill? Like you had trouble getting up there, even? I don't think so. I think, it, but it was in the hills of Hollywood. I think. I think that might be Gary. In, in which case, I will um inter reintroduce you because he would be a good interview. <laughs> That would be fun. He had a show and it, it had to do with him being Jewish and, you know, being a circus person. And um, that might be somebody else. Yeah, I'm not sure. Well, there's a lot of of of, of us in town, <laughs> Bob Yerkes, but he didn't have a show. But I'm hmm, maybe it'll come to me. It was really I'm sure I probably know them. I wonder if I have, you know, sometimes it, <laughs> we were talking about organization. Sometimes I list things like in my phone book, like maybe under circus. No. <laughs> I'm going to go have to take a class with you, Kathy. I met somebody the other day, literally for two seconds. And I said, Nathan Stein, does that sound right? No, I don't know him. Maybe that's him. Uh, now, don't ask me why I looked at that. But anyway, All right, I'm going to look it up. You're so I'm going to come take classes. You and Nicole Rice, our manager at the club. She's like, I traveled with her recently. And she was ridiculously organized and then she got to see close up like how what a nervous wreck i am she's like i have to get it together because you are <laughs> scattered mess she didn't really say that but that's what she meant um my i met somebody like for two seconds i kid you not right after we came home and i because i was already thinking hmm i need to do something about this not everybody's like this and so i met these people and i said you know because i tend to be sort of anxious and they go you think and i'm like i've talked to you for like two seconds <laughs> This is not good. They knew that. <laughs> if it shows that quickly, you need to fix it. <laughs> so I'm going to work on that. But everybody, everybody gets along with what they have, right? Yes. <laughs> you, you learn to function. Yeah. My friend, Haynes, her book, her, her book of charts or her, her bag of charts was totally like out of order. You know, it wasn't like no numbers, no alphabetical. And she had over, you know, several hundred charts. So one time I sat down with her and I wrote all the numbers on the charts, you know, one, two, three, you know, and we made a list. Well, the next time I saw her book, it was totally <laughs> out of order. <laughs> that was the only way she could function. Yeah. And she yeah. knew, she knew what she had and she knew where they were. I don't, I don't know how she did, but I had an assistant that cleaned up my desk once while I was out of town at the literary agency because she couldn't stand it anymore. And um, I have stuff. I'm a spreader outer. And if you say, where is, you know, this, I can literally lift up that envelope and find it if I, I, I need to be able to see it somehow. So she made these fabulous files. Everything was labeled. I should have been able to just go boom, 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 boom. Couldn't find a thing it drove me nuts and so within you know days it was all spread out again <laughs> like thank you so much for you know helping it's you did a beautiful job but <laughs> people are you know people are their own um, <laughs> no it's back again could, could i ask you to put your phone on something soft so because oh it, is it vibrating oh it makes a noise let me turn um, it off so we have uh mark baldrich posted uh these boots are made for walking and we will see that momentarily Oh, <laughs> Miho Kiddo is here. Hi, Miho. It's her birthday coming up. Oh. She sang the other night at the jam session. She sang so beautifully. She's oh, good. Smile. Miho is so full of joy and um, just so as she's she supports and is there at everything. And even when she had to drive all the way from Long Beach, I don't know how she did it. That's I what know. I love about these people. I know. Isn't it great? It really is. It really is. But I'm so glad she doesn't have to drive so far now. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I well, like you, I mean, or you like me, whichever. <laughs> we've hosted these kind of jam sessions for years. How long has yours been going on at the Gardenia? It's been going 22 years. I've been involved 21 of them. And I mean, there's yeah, sometimes it can be, you know, frustrating over different things. But for the most part, I would say it's so much fun to have people get up and pour their heart out and see them improve over time. Oh, yes. And also make friendships 
you know. Um, that's how I got to be friends with Linda Smith, actually. She came to my jam session, and I, you know, we became best friends. And Jody, I adore her, both of them. Yeah. <clears throat> so, um, now you had, when I was sort of starting to sing again, which I had stopped for a long time, you had the, um, by the way, your mother's here. <laughs> Hello, mother. The Sportsman's Lodge. Yes. Right. And so that terrified me because I would hear, you know, I was instrumentalist, not a lot of singers, and I was so terrified. And, and I didn't know squat, so it's a good thing I didn't go. But I should have gone to just listen. But I never went. But I would hear your name all the time and <laughs> and, and Sportsman's Lodge and Sportsman's Lodge jam session. And, and I, now I wish I had gone, but... But, that yeah. was the most, the best jam session ever. It was seven years every Wednesday. That oh, was, wow. And people, all kinds of people came in because the location was, you know, excellent, right? And Studio City and oh, yeah. people staying in the hotel and all kinds of people. We got stars coming in and to sing and stuff. But uh, the group was just so loving and fun and... I guess my attitude, you know, bring up people a lot, you know, like, oh, somebody, Nick Mancini comes in with his vibes, new in town, come on up, <laughs> you know? And, that was a good choice. <laughs> yeah. Mix, you know, mixing it up. And right. times we had, <laughs> we had singers, like a group of us, maybe eight or nine singers, get up and sing like background harmonies together and um so it was very it was very fun very You're fearless fearless <laughs> well and i need a little bit of that too there's a lot of many many things i admire about you kathy and and that's definitely one of them too fearlessness you and uh dolores cassese is like that too she'll come in and um and say you know i always tease her about i want to do this um Bollywood sort of bolero, La Boheme-ish kind of feel. I've never done this before, but I want to try. And it and it never fails. It's awesome because how could something like that fail? You know, I mean, it's just because she goes for it, and it's always sounds amazing. But I always sort of think, hmm, how's this going to work? <laughs> but you know, that's one of the beautiful things about this and I know that you've experienced that like you were talking about people that have never sung before that you asked them one night like I I asked Elliot Zweibach do you sing he was reviewing and he was a huge fan of the art form of cabaret and and musical theater and all sorts of music but um he said that that night he said I'll think about it which normally he wouldn't have said and watching these people grow and become singers is amazing but also you know we have people that are that are on the way to the Carlisle room or, you know, Molly Ringwald has stopped in late at night. And somebody reminded me, Elliot reminded me, Tyne Daly came just to kind of check out the room before she sang. But it's it's nice because I do some Facebook live streaming now, but I didn't used to do anything. And I wouldn't for somebody like that that's trying something out. And um, they know it's a safe space. And then we have the people you know, there's somebody on their way to the Kyla room, and then there's the guy walking down the street that sees the sign that goes, oh, I've always wanted to be a singer. <laughs> and sometimes they are fabulous and sometimes not. But <laughs> it's so great anyway, because where else can you give that person a gift of singing with these kind of musicians? I mean, talk about like, like high end karaoke. I mean, it's like and m all of our musicians feel that way. Yeah. But like how nice to be able to give this person an opportunity to do something that they never would have done singing, period, let alone with this caliber of musicians that they will, you know, remember forever. And it's, you know, when we had a couple of doctors and they're in labs looking at, you know, slides all day trying to find diseases. And it's like, oh, I get out of that cubicle and look at me tonight. I'm a singer. And that's the most joyous feeling to give people that opportunity yeah it's not just about singer singers coming it's you know that as well yeah yeah i almost you know like in my workshops for instance i i i many times i just think i would rather be here watching these singers get up than go out and hear anything yeah <laughs> because, absolutely you know they're it's so connected to their soul and you know it's it's exactly what you described. It's this kind of fruition of, 
of joy and creativity and you know and it goes on so many different levels for them you know it's not just the moment it's 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 everything that led to the moment you know it can be life changing and i've seen it happen and it's it's the most joyous um yeah. Sorry, I hear my dog somewhere. I think she's upstairs. <laughs> um, it's it's such a and no more than I mean, did we ever have that point driven home than we did during this pandemic? Yeah. And I remember um, being able to sing at Garden Cafe was l literally, and I'm not exaggerating if I say life saving for me yeah. Yeah. during the pandemic because they had that outdoor space. And it was a gig and I was singing. And so every once in a while I could call up people, but when I would see their face, when they were getting to sing live again with a live, with live musicians, I said to the owner, Saeed, who's wonderful. And I said, um, I think I have some singers that would love to be able to sing. Can we do a jam here? And I didn't want to compete with the open mic at all, but we weren't open yet. So we did that and to see, um, people's faces that first night when they were back singing again it was just unbelievable <laughs> it was just goosebumpy <laughs> you get to and even even dory and dave were playing that night and they were like oh <laughs> weird to not have lag <laughs> i can delay a little bit if you want <laughs> so we, we've had that point driven home about music and what it can do more than ever, you know, yeah. the past couple of years. We're getting some love here, you know. Aww. We got, you know, Karen, Cruz, and Aviva. You two give such a gift to the community, and you do it with love and grace. And, and Judy, thank you, girls. We love you. That's so sweet. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. It's nice that, that to be appreciated. It certainly is, because it makes you want to keep doing it. And you know, this is actually the perfect time to show that video that Dory sent over. Oh, cool. Of the Zoom. <laughs> yeah. Uh, is that what it is? The is it I think it's it's a collection of when we were doing the Zoom. We we want to do a little bit more to it because Dory had a great idea of putting the sign of the open mic and then the new sign when it said, you know, wear your mask and we're closed and and then open with that. But this is just a couple of clips from yeah. our Zoom. Let me, um, I'm going <clears> to, <throat> I'm going to save it and open it here so I can maybe get a little, little bigger here. There we go. There we are. Yeah. Again, I'm so glad you're doing this. <laughs> Gentlemen, this Woohoo! Look at that. Thinking, what the hell am I thinking? It's funny though. <laughs> Do you peel off the picture first or people just your face i mean like how much pumpkin have you eaten in the past three days oh my god you know every time i touch this i think i have mosquito bites i sit on a pillow low swing kind of sexy walkie bass stripper you like <laughs> oh that was it no it froze just like our zoom oh, actually, <laughs> or maybe that was it oh well, so I don't know where it went. Seconds. Oh, damn. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe it didn't all come through. I think we had we had some more, but oh. you know, that was that was also just, you know, saved me being able to still visit with everybody. And we celebrated birthdays. We celebrated losses. We celebrated, um, you know, just be the fact that we were able to be together. Yeah. And I get you for the opening. Now I'm going to show these boots are made for walking. OK. This is the fabulous Carrie Kelsey. Oh. <laughs> Michael Saucier on bass. Is that Jack Lecomte? It sure drum? is. Oh my gosh. It sure is. And um, Mike Farrell on piano. Oh. Okay.
great song. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like Irving Berlin lyrics. <laughs> I can't sing without dancing, apparently. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's definitely one of my favorite songs to sing. Um, I finally learned to wait for the bass line to finish before I before I say the, are you ready, boots, start walking. I think Aviva has a French version. Really? <laughs> that's what she said. I haven't heard it. And I'm not attempting the French version. I like the, that's funny. the lyrics are hilarious. I mean, they're, who, who, you, you keep lying when you ought to be truthing. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you keep saying when you ought to be a change it's like okay <laughs> but it's just such an amazing group chuck chuck berghoff berghoff yeah what did he say his last name berghoff berghoff yeah he was um uh that was quite a line that he created quite the line yep <laughs> uh, and by the way j.s blake oh janet janet She's on YouTube, um, and she said, hi, it was a credible night. You own this song. <laughs> oh, now Larry Davis usually comes up and dances with me. He's an amazing dancer, and I, I have like a whole crew. We did it um, <laughs> right before for Thanksgiving, because I love to, um, I sometimes close with a ballad, but I love to close with that and get everybody dancing before we have a big break, especially. <laughs> next, week out, not this week, but next week, I'll be doing it in my Santa suit, probably. Oh, it's a famous Santa suit. <laughs> For our toy drive. Yeah. <laughs> nice. I don't I really don't come to the gardenia. It's terrible. I I uh, I you know, I don't know, what can I say? <laughs> yeah, you should. It's a great you know, it's such a great classic old school room. Um it's very interesting because I it's funny, the two places that I'm working a lot lately are um the Gardenia and Garden Cafe both start with a G and both are an L shape. <laughs> <laughs> but the Gardenia has, um, you know, it's been a home for me for so long. And I just, I remember walking in the first time going, this is fabulous. I mean, it's just that old, I mean, it's the longest running supper club in the country. I think it's been almost 40 years oh, wow. or 41 years. I can't remember exactly. Yeah. But, um, and Nicole has been, you know, all of these things, as you well know, you've done many of them. Yeah. It's not just one person, it takes a village. Yeah. And Nicole Rice has been such an amazing partner for me in this. Um, she notices, um, you know, things and she'll tell me and she'll come to me and let me know about different things. And, and I just couldn't do it without her. She's creating some baskets for us to raffle off, you know, next week. Oh. She just, it's amazing. And everything that's happened through, you know, we've sort of kind of morphed and changed over the years and, um, and different things have, have helped us do that. And Terry Cole coming in on lights and sound and Dory coming in and sitting in Michael Soche coming in and sitting in that's, you know, kind of morphed us into a whole different direction. Yeah. I, I didn't really tell, I mean, a lot of the people here are people we know, but um, so Carrie runs a weekly 
session at the Gardenia Club in Hollywood, which is, as she said, one of the oldest, if not the oldest, cabaret rooms in the country. It's a beautiful room. Um, it's right down down in Hollywood, and or kind of the west West Hollywood. I guess. You know, the line dividing Los Angeles and West Hollywood runs right through the middle of the room. <laughs> And I, I didn't know if I really had that right. And so when I had to go to the uh, West Hollywood Police Department recently, <laughs> because um, long story, but it involved um, Scotty Bauer's um, storage room and finding a grenade. Um, oh. But <laughs> when I went, I asked them, I said, is that really true? And they said, it absolutely is. Like that's the, you know, depending on which side of the room you're on is which police department you call, I guess. That's crazy. Yeah. And the Garden Cafe, that is, I, I always ask you this, but it's just literally every two weeks, no matter what. Every two weeks, rain or shine. We were in the rain last week. Now, I, I say that, but they had something else one week and I couldn't do that Thursday or Saturday. Saturday was Craig's show, Thursday I had something. And so we skipped and then the next week was Thanksgiving. So holidays and sometimes something comes up, but we're pretty much back on schedule. We did last Friday in the rain. We'll do the I think it's the 16th and then um then we're back uh, for the regular schedule in january as well so every other friday it's fun come hang out i get as i bring up singers when i can too so and and the time like to that do. is seven to seven to nine. Oh yeah it's earlier on friday yeah if they close at um 10 on on friday night so because the gardenia is goes later right yes the gardenia we start at 8 30 ish now um but we uh, we used to start at nine the shows there still start at nine you go in you have dinner and they clear your plate and the show starts at nine you know it runs about an hour 10 hour 20. Yeah. but um but we, and so we used to start at the same time the shows start but we run much later so we start a little earlier this week we have tonight this week um andy langham on piano uh, Doria Murillo and Adam Cohen on bass. Nice band. Yep. And next week we have, um, I'll just announce now. Let me see if I can remember. Dave Mosco, um, Gabe Davis, Doria Murillo, and Mark Sanfilippo on drums. We're having a drummer next week. Too. Uh, cool. And that was so great to see Jack, wasn't it? He used to sit in with us periodically. Sweetest man ever. Yeah such a loss so many so many losses lately yeah i know gosh too I just, much uh, there's a, a jean cipriano who was um the partner of cat connor do you know cat connor no i don't think i do so she's and also <laughs> she's a singer and she's also a clown ah see how it all comes together <laughs> Yeah, and uh, she's been a clown for years. <clears throat> and she said some funny stories. Oh my god! <laughs> One story she told me was they hired her to be a drunk mermaid at a party, <laughs> like lying around on the you know on the chaise lounge, you know, and drunk. And <laughs> oh, no. dressed as a mermaid. Um, let's see. One <laughs> in the morning, she was. <laughs> so they had like a, a morning business meeting, right? somebody and the and the table of bagels and all that stuff and with a <laughs> with a top in the middle you know on a plate or whatever and her head was in there <gasps> you know she was from under the bottom so when people looked up she'd say oh no that must have been halloween <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh first of all the thought of the mermaid costume is so claustrophobic <laughs> She's really funny too. She's just got a real cheerful face, you know. <laughs> I don't know if I could do that. I'd be going, I'm just pretending. I'm not really, I'm not really obnoxious. <laughs> I don't know if I can do it, but it's not funny the way it all comes. My mother introduced, um, I mean, she met somebody at a party and she said, um, my daughter married a trapeze artist, which usually gets a reaction as you can imagine. <laughs> yeah. And she said this woman didn't react at all. And she thought, well, that's odd. And then a little while later, she found out because her daughter had married a clown with the circus. <laughs> so she didn't think anything of it. It's like, of course. Of course she did. Of course she has a trapeze in her backyard, doesn't everybody? <laughs> oh, my God. Well, Mary Bogus reminded me the cat is Mrs. Santa, too. <laughs> oh. Yeah. I need to, I'm, you know, I'm I'm newbie into, with, with some of these, um, some of the community, especially the jazz community, because I'm 
I mean, I literally, people would talk about the weather report and I'm like, oh, I love that song. It's Rain and Men. It was the weather girls. <laughs> so I had a huge learning curve, but I'm, um, I hope I'm, I'm, it's, it's not as curvy as it was. I'm and apparently a... Jody said she was a clown too. That's right. I've seen a picture. She sent me one. Yeah. I've seen proof of that. Called, called boss. <laughs> She Gee. had a cute clown costume too. I was only, the only thing I, I sold popcorn, which didn't require leaving the ground and programs and balloons, which almost left the ground. There were so many of them. And then I um, was one night we did a show called Midnight Clowns and I was the ring mistress. And I got to wear the costume that Christy oh. Brinkley was supposed to wear because she was supposed to do our, um, our big gala that we have. And she was sick. So she sent Billy Joel instead. <laughs> But he didn't wear the costume, but then I got to wear it later. It was like a really pretty sparkly bra thing with white tails, like circus ring. But I was the ring mistress, literally like the mistress of the ring master for our little play. <laughs> very intriguing. <laughs> it was fun. We had t-shirts made, everything. It was a very cool show. <laughs> you, were you, did you spend time as an actress as well? I did. That was my major i um i grew up it's it's funny because when i when i got married and you know had alex my son i i sort of everything just became about them and about that and one day um i'd gone through a terrible depression you know during my divorce i had gotten mugged it was and i was and going to therapy because i thought i gotta do something and the therapist said to me what do you like to do and i literally was silent probably for the first time in my life and said, can I tell you next week? I couldn't remember. <laughs> oh, shit. Isn't that awful? I mean, it's awful. My my whole everything had just become about other people, which, you know, I, I think is some in some ways a responsibility <laughs> as a parent, but it's also, you know, important to not give up yourself completely. And so I came back the next week saying, um, I remember I used to like to dance. I started taking tango lessons. I went back to school mm. to learn sign language and went through the interpreter program at Pierce. Um, but then I totally had forgotten that I loved to sing. And I grew up, my parents were musicians. My um, my stepfather um, has a, de a doctor's degree in orchestral conducting. My mother came from a very classical background and then eventually moved into she did a lot of Gilbert and Sullivan. They had a group called the Wandering Minstrels and then moved into musical theater. So my background was classical church music. They were the, uh, he was the organist choir master. She was the soloist of our Methodist church and the conservative synagogue in town. So I went to both. Consequently, I live next door to a Methodist church and the synagogue is on Van Nuys. So I feel right at home. But, um, but that was my background. And I couldn't even join brownies because it, it was on the day of choir practice. So I grew up, you know, with that. So I had a very strong, strong classical background. I would buy sheet, I have pristine sheet music from years because I would buy it and go, this is not my key, but that's what the composer wanted me to sing it in. And I put it away and not sing it because I didn't have any idea that I could, even if I knew the person who recorded it didn't put it in that key, I would still be like, well, I have to, that's what I have to do it in. If you audition for a role, if you can't sing it, you don't get it. So it took me, um, a long time to, but one day we were in the um, beauty salon and um, <laughs> what do they call them now? And my mother was reading the LA times when you could still get the paper part. I guess you still can. <clears throat> and there was something called, um, there's an article about cabaret. And she said, this sounds like something you've always wanted to do. And I only knew the show cabaret. I knew nothing. And I thought, yeah, she's right. I forgot to take it with me. Computers were new. I Googled, I, LA Times, I looked up cabaret and the keywords, found the article, called the woman who was Pisha McPhee. Oh. You, you could call directory assistants <clears throat> and say, I'd like to take this class. She said, come audition. I auditioned, um, went that night with Mel Danksel, who's amazing, amazing pianist. And he said, well, start, you know, what key? And I said, this one. And he goes, no, 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 just start singing. And I went, I remember calling my mother going, he told me to just start singing. And I, I mean, can you believe this? And, you know, he could just play it in any key and it was fascinating. And I, I was in that class for a very long time and um, learned so much, you know, from both of them. And then at, at that point, you know, at some point I went to the Gardenia and 
then you start getting, you know, I learned as much as I could and absorbed as much as I could with that. And then all of a sudden meeting, you know, hearing jazz and <clears throat> getting involved with that. Growing up, we had um, four albums in my house. We had um, that weren't classical. My Fair Lady, My Name is Barbara, Oklahoma Carousel Combo, and The Graduate. So <laughs> I, I played those ad nauseum because it was the only you know non-classical. And then one day I went to Win Dixie. <clears throat> Does anybody remember Win Dixie? No, I don't. What is that? It's a Southern grocery store. <laughs> W I N N and then Dixie. I have no idea why. Okay. And um, for five, I think like two or three dollars and a can of Campbell's soup, you could buy this album called mm -mm Good. <laughs> <laughs> and I meant to actually look up oh, who gosh. the jazz band was, but <laughs> I brought this home and I was like, what is this? There was John Davidson singing Sunny. I love, to this day, I sing that song. Diane Carroll singing um, Going Out of My Head, um, Stephen Eady with a funny version of Mame. Um, there's a, Jim Neighbors sang There's a Kind of Hush, Say a Little Prayer, Johnny Mathis. And that album was like it for me. I was like, oh my gosh, I didn't know there was such a thing as music like this, which is funny. It was such, so made such an impression. And then at about 13, somebody played Cleo Lane, Born on a Friday. And I was like, what is that? <laughs> I loved it. And again, still to this day, I play, I had to have CDs made of them because they don't even, like Born on a Friday, you can't even get on iTunes. Really? Yeah, for some reason. I mean, you could pull it up on YouTube and stuff, but I don't know why that particular album, because it's probably my favorite of hers. Well, I, yeah, I and I actually grew up with uh, Call Me Bar Color Me Barbara too. You did? Yep. I my, think mine was My Name Is Barbara. You have Color Me. That was a better album, I think. Color Me Barbara. Yeah. Well, I might have had My Name Is Barbara too. I, we had several Barbara Streisand records. I mean, my sisters were four years older than me, twins, and so they uh, and they sang, and one played piano. Oh wow! So, we, so they could be their own group. Yeah. Well, and we were. <laughs> the wow. Twins and Kathy. <laughs> what what were you called? The Seagull Twins and Kathy? I love that. <laughs> but what kind of music did you, was that your beginnings? Yeah, my dad, well, my mom had been a singer. My dad was a sax player. So he, he was like, uh, you know, he did casuals and he did dance band gigs and stuff. And so when we came along, we just, I don't know how we naturally got into singing, but we all got into singing. And um, so, and like you said, those sheet musics, sheet music at that time, you bought it, you played it, and you did it in that key. And my sister <clears throat> could read the literal piano notes. Right. She didn't read the chords. So she could play the piano on that sheet, but she couldn't transpose. So the three of us harmonized and one, you know, I think it was, well, at least when I was younger, I had the melody, but you know, it was pretty high. So whatever key you're given is what you're yeah, going to be singing. Yeah. So, and then we started working with our dad and we started going out and singing at old age homes and, you know, stuff like that. That is, now was your jazz, dad played sax, so he was a jazz musician? Yeah, pretty much a jazz. So that's kind of what you were exposed to in the house musically. With yeah. your record collection and stuff. We, did, we weren't exposed. <clears throat> Cl classical didn't exist in our house. Show some show music did, but, but that was what was happening at that time, right? Right. Shows and uh, well, and, and that became all the jazz standards too. They were all from yeah shows pretty much. Yeah. And then jazz people. I mean, the the singers I remember listening to mostly were like Ella, and Rosemary Clooney and Judy Garland. Those that's a good like eclectic mix but but what those are like the would probably be the ideal people to listen to they, and, uh, if you think about it each one of them had great phrasing oh yes so ella uh, judy um her phrasing was fascinating uh, i think the reason that she spoke to so many people was her honesty it was yeah. heartbreaking so judy ella and who was the other one um <clears throat> Rosemary Clooney. Rosemary Clooney. Yeah. See, that's all very different phrasing. Yeah. And yeah. That yeah. Was, that's a good mix. Yeah. yeah. And then, you know, of course, um, what, what, yeah. So the 60s started happening. 
<laughs> you know, it was like the Beatles and, you know, I, you know, my sisters were four years older, so they were listening to all the great rock and roll stuff happening, you know, and that was, so that really got in there and, um, you know, <laughs> um, I'm just laughing. I remember um, that the doggy in the window, I think that was the, the big song when I was born. Oh, how much <laughs> is that doggy in the window? I love that. The one with the waggly tail. How much is that? I don't know why I know that song, but I I had a little repertoire when I was three and they would put me up on like in front of the choir to sing. <laughs> <as well. laughs> the only one I remember is the one from South Pacific that the kids sing. Um, Dites-moi pourquoi la vie est belle. That's the, still the only French I know. <laughs> that yeah. one but that was now see in the 60s um i unfortunately was um missed the beatles a little bit i did i can remember as a child my parents dressing up my stepdad dressed up as one of the beatles and my mother was a beatles fan and they went to some costume party like that but i was not listening to them at all i was listening to donny osmond <laughs> and I had one Elvis Presley album and one Tom Jones album, which again, to this day, <laughs> I still like his version of Fly Me to the Moon. But it's, it's, it's interesting because through the years, I think I didn't like, I, I mean, Beatles were incredible writers and I'm realizing, you know, more and more. But I always noticed their songs when other people were singing them. Like Sergio Mendez, I was like, that's a fabulous song, Fool on the Hill, who wrote that? <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't know, which is terrible. And then the other day I heard, um, there are places I remember, but I heard somebody else doing it. Actually, you know what it was? <clears throat> it was Donny Osmond at his show in Las Vegas. Oh, oh. terrible. And, um, but he did a great version of it. And I was like, oh, let me look up those lyrics. Oh, the Beatles. You know. so, <laughs> and I sang it the other night at the open mic because um, I liked what, what I had heard. Yeah, well, I mean, the Beatles didn't always sound great singing their own songs. I was learning a few songs recently for a recording session where they wanted us to do it in a different kind of a more of a jazz way. And um, yeah, I, I couldn't really, I mean, I knew the song, I liked the song, but I couldn't find a great Beatles version of it. Now, see, so, I'm glad I'm not the only one because I that sound didn't appeal to me that much. Yeah. But I, and I didn't have enough... Um, experience maybe to go these are fabulous songs because now you yeah. know we have a lot of amazing songwriters that can't really sing and i always listen to them and i think how do people listen to that and go that's a great song i want to sing it and it becomes you know so one of my song. one of my uh referrals to that is is dylan I could never listen to Dylan. I hated his singing. <laughs> his songwriting was so great. And people would take these songs and do them. And I'm like, how do you even listen to him to tell if the song is good? He's such a terrible singer, right? It, you know, that's so funny. He, he, somebody did a series of, oh, it was somebody from the new Saturday Night Live cast. And he was on Jimmy Fallon and he did Dylan through the years, like all of his different sounds. Oh, wow. It was hilarious apparently there was a rock and roll dylan which was <laughs> mostly him screaming you couldn't understand or something it was <laughs> it was hilarious and he sounded exactly <laughs> like him i read his book um which was interesting to me because he mentions john jacob niles uh -huh. who my mother debuted his song cycle uh -huh. one of john jacob niles she, he came to something she was singing and he said i found my singer and i think it was called october song cycle and, and there's a picture of me as a child. I loved older people and I was generally, you know, happy and smiling, but I'm looking at him like I'm terrified. <laughs> and I realized why, because he had that very unusual, high, high, high soprano falsetto-y voice that didn't look like it should come out of him. And so I think as a kid, it was confusing. So I, I don't know if I was looking scared or like, what is that sound <laughs> with his I, dulcimer, I guess it was that he played. And but that was fascinating. <laughs> oh um, let's see, uh, Gary Brumberg saying hello. Hey, Gary from Tennessee. Nora Paradiso remembers Winn-Dixie. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah, she lived in Georgia. Yeah. 
And Linda Smith said, yep, Mel Dansel was amazing. I studied with him at LACC and then with, with Pisha McPhee's private workshop. That's right. She was there before me. I met a lot of people in that workshop that, that I'm still friends with, but she was there before me. Hi, Linda. I love Linda. I love Linda. She's a sweetheart and hilarious. She's you know so what funny. I like about Linda? She'll tell I, you the truth. <laughs> well, yeah, but the one. But People another, say that about her. I'm glad she hasn't had to tell me anything I didn't want to hear yet. <laughs> She's kind too. Oh, good. <laughs> you know, after all in all the years I have known her, there was maybe one time when I asked her how she was on the phone and she didn't say something like, oh, you know, pretty good for today or another day on planet Earth or, you know, in that kind of, oh, you know, yep, you know. <laughs> <laughs> one time she was aggravated <laughs> i won't say why but <laughs> she was aggravated but it was like wow linda's aggravated <laughs> you know, the world is coming to an end or something. <laughs> but that means you're a good enough friend that she can tell you because we only tell our good friends when we're because other people don't care they just want to hear fine how are you that it's just polite before we get to like what we're really calling about but um with people that you know well you can say you know i'm kind of bummed or you know, whatever, <laughs> but we try not to, because you don't want to take other people down with you. <laughs> Sometimes I think I'll call this person and I'm going to vent a little bit because I'm, I'm feeling kind of down and then they beat me to it. <laughs> so then I'm like, well, now I just started trying to try to cheer them up. When am I going to get, who am I going to call now? <laughs> so that I could say I'm down and bummed. <laughs> Darn it. You're too fast. <laughs> I'm going to play um, your Contigo Aprendi. Oh, okay. I haven't heard uh, this in a while. Yeah, this is not a visual, ladies and gentlemen. It's just an audio. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first time it's heard by other people, I think. Oh. Well. Should I tell who, who it is first or after? Sure. Go ahead. This is um, Leonardo Amuedo, Leo Amuedo, who um, is currently touring with Chris Bodie. He toured with Yvonne Lins, who is, I, I'm crazy about him. Um, I know so many people that have gotten to work with him, and um, but Leo toured with him for years. And uh, for a long time, I would I would listen to the videos. And I, you know, sometimes um, there can be fabulous musicians, but they don't always speak to you. His guitar playing spoke to me. And um, I would think, how does, I mean, he could just plug in any place and get that sound. It's amazing. And so I met him at NAM, and we became friendly. He came a couple of times and actually sat in at the open mic and was the most humble um, person. Um, and then I finally said, can I record something with you? And I was going to do it in Spanish. So I really wanted um, somebody that spoke Spanish to help me and make sure that I was doing it right. And so I recorded in his home studio this song. And here it is. Contigo aprendí que existen nuevas y mejores emociones. Contigo aprendí a conocer delusiones aprendí que la semana tiene más de siete días hacer mayores mis contadas alegrías y hacer dichoso yo contigo aprendí Contigo aprendí a ver la luz del otro lado de la luna. Contigo aprendí que tu presencia no la cambio por ninguna. Aprendí 
que puedo un peso ser más dulce, más profundo. Que puedo irme mañana mismo de este mundo. Las cosas buenas ya contigo las viví. Y contigo aprendí que yo nací el día en que te conocí. Contigo aprendí a ver la luz del otro lado de la luna. Contigo aprendí que tu presencia no la cambio por ninguna. Aprendí que puedo un peso ser más dulce y más profundo que puedo irme mañana mismo de este mundo las cosas buenas ya contigo las viví y contigo aprendí que yo nací el día que te conocí Contigo aprendí. Oh, so pretty. Have I muted? Thank you. That has the most beautiful visuals and the lyrics. It's um, with you I learned. And one of them is with you I learned to see the lights on the other side of the moon. With you I learned and all of the, vis the visuals are so um beautiful uh, the same man that wrote um mancinero the same man that wrote uh imp it's impossible or somos novios yeah the spanish language is uh so romantic and poetic and i remember my my first husband gus garcia ah. his mother was <clears throat> she was a famous singer actually she was called the the angel of mexico when she was 14 to like into her 30s. Wow. Um, she uh, taught me Sabora Me. Uh, and I was so totally flabbergasted to <laughs> know what the words were. You know, was, who's, you know, in English, you would never say, you'll never forget the taste of me in your mouth. You'll never, you know, that would yes. never happen in a song, you know? <laughs> maybe in a poem. You know? Maybe in a, yes. <clears throat> but they're not afraid to be very, um, sexy it's just sexy you know and and even somos novios it's like um the, the term novios i mean but nora can tell better than me it's sometimes used for boyfriend girlfriend but it's also sort of like we are lovers and it's just um it's not it's impossible <laughs> it's one of the translations that that not all of them work but um but it's still beautiful i mean i like it's impossible and i love somos novios but yeah there's something about um singing the Spanish that something about the language, which may be why I ended up with a Latin, because my husband was Gaona. Um, because that language just is soothing to me, you know, I can be at the beach and hear people talking in Spanish, and it's so soothing. Um, it's interesting, she was called the, the, the angel of Mexico. Mm -hmm. And one of my favorite singers is Luis Miguel, who's called El Sol de Mexico, the son of Mexico. Oh, yeah, she was, uh, and she, she didn't marry, but she was on the road with um, one of Mexico's most famous composers named Gonzalo Curiel, and um, he, he, uh, they dedicate a day of the year to him. Um, wow. He was, but 
that's my husband Gus. That was his father. <laughs> they were on the road, and he got he got Adelina pregnant, um, and um, yeah. So uh, well, he what did he sing? Your first husband was he a musician? He was, With that kind of background, I would think he was an awesome guitar player. He and it was self taught, which was really incredible because he was kind of a jazz Latin player, and he wrote beautiful songs. Then he then he moved into art. You know, I have some some of his pieces here. Uh, everything was self taught, and he was really he was really good. Wow, that kind of a pedigree is quite something. I yeah. would think that it would would be you know, I wouldn't think he would end up an accountant. <laughs> no, <laughs> <laughs> definitely going to be some. There's no no other genes there, you know, other than yeah. singing and music and. Yeah, musicianship. She, she was a bolero <clears throat> singer, right? You know, so she was, ah, oh, yeah, you know, that kind of singer. Yes, and I love really, that. Quite beautiful. Yeah, it was really nice. There's, there's a lot of information on her uh, online, you know, and um, yeah, very old recordings and, <clears throat> but pretty awesome. Tell me her name again, because I'm going to Google her. Yeah, her name was <laughs> Adelina Garcia. Adelina is a very pretty name too. Adelina Garcia. Yeah, she. She um, ha she got married subsequently to um, this man named Joseph Heredia, who was uh, in the mo Hollywood movies as uh, like the lead percussionist for bands that were on film. <clears throat> and he, one of his sons, one of their sons is, uh, you, you might not have run into him, but- Joey Heredia? Yeah. Yes, I was just gonna say, is he related to Joy Heredia? Of course, he's a fabulous player. Yeah, so <laughs> I've heard my, him do a lot of great Brazilian music. Yeah, he's my, well, we call each other brother and sister, but he was my first brother-in-law. Wow, yeah. that's funny because I'm still close to my brother-in-law, so that's funny. <laughs> Joey, yes, he's fabulous player. I used to see him, um, you know, the first time I ever went to Urban Press, I think was to see him play. Oh. I, and I know him, that group through Dory also, which is where I've gotten a lot of my exposure to a lot of a lot of you guys. Yeah. Although, Kathy, I remember you from a long, long time ago when I went to one of your um, fabulous sessions because it was the Jazz Society, I think it was called, right? Oh, your you mean group? what Linda and I and Jody and created? Um, the California... <laughs> I don't remember, ladies. I don't remember either, but... Yeah. Yeah, I thought it was the Jazz Society. Is that not it? No, it oh. wasn't the Jazz Society. It, it was a group of singers who would put on shows and stuff. Well, I remember Jeffrey Tozer took me to a, a event that you were putting on. I don't even remember if we were at like CSUN or something, but it was huge. And you had the guy that had started CD Baby, which for some reason I thought he had something to do with Manhattan Transfer, but or maybe there was just a Manhattan Transfer person there. Yeah, I don't know. It was I mean, a panel that you had, and I remember um, that the CD Baby guy was just a wealth of information. This was, I don't know how many years ago, and I remember it. You know, <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's so much to create. You know, I was looking, what was I doing the other day? I was, I don't know, maybe <clears throat> my husband watches a lot of those shows like, uh, you know, to talk about all the mysteries of the world, you know. <laughs> I, maybe it was that, but I was looking at all the <clears throat> all the different universes there are. You know, like you and I are in this little universe right now, right? And and we are connected to other people's universes. But it's kind of like uh, the men in black, you know? <laughs> this is our, <laughs> what we know is about, you know, this much of other mm -hmm. universes, you know? It just goes on and on and on. And we, we can we create anything we want and, um, you know, keep moving ahead. And I mean, and I look back at my, you know, my ideas, like that, that list we were talking about. Right. You know, the 28 page list I have of all these. <laughs> I kept thinking 28 things isn't bad, but it's 28 pages. That's 28. different. <laughs> yeah, because like you, when I get an idea, I have to write it down or else it's going to drive me crazy. Or I'll, what if I forget it? Then we forget and then it drives you crazy trying to go back to the room where you thought of it or try to watch what you were watching when you thought of it to try to you spend way too much time trying to remember it. It's better to just write it down. Yeah. <laughs> well, I try to remember this universe thing when I'm scared, when I'm nervous, you know, I get a lot of stage fright. And so I try to remember either this isn't real 
or this is an alternate universe or, you know, something, or it's some, we're a speck. I think Kiki Ebsen talks about her dad taking her outside when she was nervous and Buddy Ebsen and saying, do you see those stars up there? And it was some sort of a comparison about, you know, where we are. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was a minuscule little thing. And I was like, that's a good thing to remember. It was something like that. I'm paraphrasing. I don't remember, but but I thought mm, I think I know what he was trying to tell her. You know, it's yeah. like don't be so nervous about this. But I have yeah. a little. I have a little different take on that. Mine is um, I created this whole universe right now that I'm experiencing. This is my creation. So if I want to mess up, I can mess up. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it's my freaking universe. I can do whatever I want. And call it not messing up. It's the right thing. Yeah, it's just it's just what it is. I can do it. You know, I can. <laughs> no wonder you're fearless. But you know, you've done so many, many, many. Not just um, musically yourself, singing and your albums and your musicianship, but mm. all of the like this group I'm talking about and all of the things that you have given to people in other ways by like. That's what I like about presenting workshops is giving people an opportunity to do and meet with people and work with people they wouldn't have a chance to. And you do that and you've um, that that panel was such a gift for the people that were doing those, you know, looking for that information at the time. And for me, I carried it with me. And it's like I think about it now. OK, things have changed a little bit and that it's not, you know, a CD that you're putting out that I remember him saying when they've sold, you know, a couple, they'll ask you for a, a couple more. And now, of course, it's more a digital platform, I guess, but it's still the same, you know, concept and same details. But anyway, it's amazing all all of the different areas that you've been involved in and how long you've been involved in them and the things that you've done for people. And I want to personally say thank you <laughs> for all that you do. <laughs> so wait, on your list, on your post-it list, what, what do you, uh, by the way, California Pop and Jazz Council, thank you, ladies and ladies. Um, <laughs> that was the name of <laughs> California Pop and Jazz Council. Yeah. Okay. Um, but what, all your post-its, what do they relate to? Do they relate to actions in in the music business or more personal stuff? Or You know, I have, I try to make two different lists. A lot of times it's a song I heard or a song I forgot that I knew that I want to go back and relearn. Sometimes it's, um, please don't forget to put your rent check in the mailbox. Um, <laughs> sometimes it's like I hang it on the door. Don't forget to take your car to the car wash. Don't forget you're out of gas, you know, because you've got to go this place tomorrow and you're not going to have gas. You know, you don't have to, you won't have time to you won't allow enough time to get it before you go. It's those basic things. But then um, then I do have a list of and passport. Go get my passport. You know, <laughs> yeah. I do have um, a list of of more kind of long term things that, that I want to work on, too. And then that shows a lot of times, you know, I'm, I'm kind of working on this Peggy Lee show now. So every time I get an idea for that, or the hardest part is writing it, you know, I, you can get the songs picked out and put those together, but then writing what you want to say yeah. and, and trying to tell people something they don't know already about Peggy Lee. Yeah, is the hard part and making it different from everybody else's. So it's, yeah. it's taken me a little while to get that. So a lot of times it's, it's show related. And, um, you know, there's a couple of shows that, that I'm working on and have in my mind. So every time that pops into my mind, especially, and I'll do like a recording. I used to leave myself messages when we could call and had a voice machine. <laughs> One day, I was so used to calling my son and telling him something or my mother and I always go, okay, love you, bye. I say that to most people. And, um, and I'm leaving a message for myself. <laughs> I hear myself go, I love you, bye. And then I'm like, well, that's okay. It's okay for me to tell myself that. <laughs> Here's my standard closing. Love you. Bye. And it's like, oh, my Lord, you're talking to yourself. <laughs> I love that. That's funny. <laughs> I think I heard somebody like after I had done it, I think I heard it on um, that New Adventures of Old Christine. She like kept leaving herself messages. <laughs> somebody said they text themselves, but I'm afraid I wouldn't look at it. I, te I text myself. You do, but you remember I to look at it? Well, yeah, because I, I I'm looking at my text a lot, you know, if if something's coming up, and um, or I email myself because I I do sit at the computer a lot and, and check emails, but I'm terrible with emails. I I you know it's so embarrassing. This sweet guy 
was supposed to come play bass for us at the open mic that Craig had recommended and he got sick and couldn't come. And so I was interacting with him a little bit about his, you know, I hope you're feeling better. And then I text myself my bitmojis so that I could take a picture of them and then add them to constant contact. And so I was texting, I thought myself, these bitmojis. And <laughs> I was texting this poor guy who got like four of them. And then he finally like, like sent a heart. My <laughs> last one said it was like a bitmoji of me with, do you love me? <laughs> so I'm like, I've never met the guy. And I was like, <laughs> when I finally figured, he wrote back something very sweet. He was so sweet. It made me just love him. And I've never even met him. And, um, and I said, I'm so <laughs> Sorry, you must think I'm insane, which might be true, but I did not mean to say <laughs> Oh my God. I, I could have died. And then I ended up using it. You know, of course, it was just a good story to, to tell everybody, but I ended up using that bitmoji just, you know, <laughs> to show people, look, there really was one <laughs> in the newsletter. It was horrifying. <laughs> I think it would have been better if I knew him. You know, it was like this person I'd never met who must think, you know, you can't take back a first impression. <laughs> it's dangerous sometimes, you know, you better not, you better not be like unconscious when you're doing, when you're I know, it, it, but you know, have you ever had it come in where a text is coming in at the same time you've pushed send and it automatically goes to the one that's coming in? I have. and it, it was That's not good. <laughs> And, and I just did everything I could to delete it, and I succeeded. But I, I worried forever that they actually saw it. <laughs> now you can unsend too. I sent somebody. I used to look at um, a text that I was getting ready to send somebody, and I was like, "Good gosh, what on earth?" And I realized somebody had pulled out in front of me, and it was still recording. And I'm screaming at the person that pulled out in front of me. <laughs> so <laughs> recently. I was like, somehow it was a very polite one and somebody, I was texting and I had made a mistake. And so I mean, I was at a stoplight texting and um, I went back to put the cursor to fix the mistake and my mic was on and I didn't realize it. And it said, you are so rude. And, <laughs> and I sent it, but luckily it was in the middle of a sentence. So I'm like, obviously that wasn't meant for you <laughs> because <laughs> if it had been like a separate sentence, they might've thought, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Because, like, that's the danger of when you're driving, <laughs> doing it. <laughs> we're different people when we're driving. <laughs> yes, we are. <laughs> a whole other person comes out, especially if you're always in a rush like me. I, I actually have accomplished, <laughs> at least once, <coughs> um, feeling better about, you know, assholes on the road. Because... <laughs> Over the years that I've been alive, you know, and studied various philosophical uh, things, I I knew that um, flowing admiration and affinity to somebody actually dissolves a lot of anger and shit, right? So <laughs> I was driving on the road and somebody was a total asshole. And I, my first inclination, of course, was to respond and then... I thought, okay, you are such a great asshole. And I, I totally meant it. You know, like I was so. <laughs> You're so really good at it. <laughs> and you know what? The, 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 all the anger and stuff just kind of dispelled. That's great. It was <laughs> They're the best jerk you've ever met. They're like so good at it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're I mean, so good at their job you know, so, there's, there's a few things that drive me crazy driving s slow in the left lane on the freeway oh, which is the passing lane that drives move me. over i want a sign that says <laughs> passing lane only you know move over <laughs> and then then there's people when you let them out and they don't thank you it's like just you know a little wave or people crossing the street that purposely go really slow it's like i try to even if i've got on heels and i can't run i'll, I'll try to indicate like thanks yeah <laughs> <laughs> and i'm as i'm hobbling with my heels across the street <laughs> it's like i'm trying you know i'm making an effort i see you i i wish i could go faster but i can't <laughs> I, I agree with all those my husband does something really my husband and i really basically do not fight ever but there's a few little things that have come up over 20 years. And one thing is we're out in a store and um, 
you know, we're walking through an aisle and I stop to do whatever. I stop to, I could look at my phone or I could look at something, you know, and I'm not, well, he, he's painfully conscious about being in the way of somebody behind who's walking, even oh. if they're not right behind us. He's like, he feels really, you know, uncomfortable for being out of the way. And I don't care. <laughs> I mean, you can go around. <laughs> yeah, well, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know, know somebody was right behind me and stop. I wouldn't do that. But if I'm walking, I, yeah, this is, <laughs> yeah, this is me walking. <laughs> it's a store if you want to stop and look. So how do you handle that? Do you just accommodate him or do you try to get him to get over it? Yeah, we, we get into issues. <laughs> That's not a bad issue to have. That's like the only one you're good. Not terrible, right? Just don't go shopping together. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so funny. And he's walking behind me so that we'll be, we, we're not taking up too much space. <laughs> oh, right. I do that a little bit too. <laughs> I do a little bit because I think when, when, well, in New York City, I do that, I guess, more because people are like, you have to go out in the street, you know, to get around somebody because everybody's yeah, in a hurry. Yeah. But um, but sometimes I do that in the store. If, if people are two people wide, is fine. Three people wide is too much. Yeah, well, there's that, not enough people yes. to go by. To I mean, I, by. I consciously do not want to block, but but I also can <laughs> I can own my space too. It's right. like oh, this is my fucking space. <laughs> you can stop and look at something if you want to and not feel bad about it. You guys are like George and Amal Clooney, though. They've never had a fight supposedly yeah no i don't know maybe they're just gonna have one big blow up and not speak to each other for like a year yeah <laughs> um <clears throat> oh judy says as in nobody's perfect except a perfect asshole <laughs> <laughs> there are some people that are very good and i find that it's it's a little bit worse these days <laughs> Maybe we're just all on edge, but I feel like people are, like driving is a scary thing these days. Uh, oh man, that's um, funny. I can't see anybody's comments. Maybe I could see them later. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> well, I'll see, now Linda's on Gary's side, which is not surprising because I call her his his girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so she's she's strange. She doesn't like sushi. I mean, come on. <laughs> And other people are saying Pierre Chambers and Roland. Come on, you guys, really? No. That it takes up too much space, you mean? Or that you're not supposed to stop? Well, it's not like the Three Stooges. Not Somebody's not like running into the back of you when you stop. You're not like... No, no, no. I don't... <laughs> how do you shop if you can't stop and look at something? And I just feel like if nobody's right behind me, then their job is to look ahead. <laughs> and go around you. Yeah, and somebody <laughs> stopped ahead and then they can, yeah. It's like somebody pulling into a driveway. You wouldn't, you'd like go around them or you wait on them to go. See? Yeah, I think that there's so, some normal protocol. Also, people don't wait for people to get off the elevator anymore but before they try to shove on. There's yeah. certain basic protocols that have gone by the wayside. It's like, why don't people teach people, let a woman go on first, which I know is old school, but let people off, get out of the way so that we can get off so that you can get, it's not going anywhere. Somebody will hold the door for you. And so as somebody's walking out, it'll stop, but it's like move so that they can get off so that you can get on. I th I agree with you. And Gary and I both talk about that. It's like strange. You know, yeah, <laughs> just wait, wait. I'm not going back down. So <laughs> I'm getting off. You might as well let me off because you're not going anywhere until I get off. So get out of my way because it's not going to go anywhere. You know, you're not going to miss it. <laughs> like, especially if there's people like filing off. Well, I'm, I have a thing about elevators anyway. I'm very claustrophobic. So. <laughs> but I'm, I'm speaking of like the mall where I go here, Fashion Square. It's, it's like a thing at the mall there. And, it, and that elevator is fine because it's glass. So I can bang on it and go, help. <laughs> people can see me. <laughs> So I don't mind getting on that one. <laughs> Hell, people aren't letting me off. I'm riding up and down all night because they won't unblock. <laughs> I've gone up and down 14 times. Because <laughs> they have strollers, too. It's like the stroller. Come on. <laughs> and that's another thing. You're not stopping in a store with a stroller. Have you noticed that? Where, like, they block every... That's a totally different kind of... <laughs> Blocking. Space. Yeah, that's a totally different one. 
Hey, now, I also, um, I wanted to ask you, I mean, on your site, it says comedian. Now, I obviously you're funny, but <laughs> <laughs> are you actually? <clears throat> no, <laughs> I can't remember where that came from. I think the very first person that did my website put that on there and then I left it. But, um, you know, one of um, Greg Gliana, who was at the very first open mic that they ever did there, who's an incredibly funny, witty writer who wrote Meet the Parents and it did the original version, dark version. And so he um, has story credit on all the subsequent ones. And he has a new movie called um, Road Dog, which I have to be careful because one night I said Road Rage because we were like, we were talking about all this stuff, but it's Road Dog, which Dory did the music for. And um, he said to me one time, he tried to talk me into it and doing like a little stand up routine because he does that. And he also writes, his is great because he'll do stand up and then he has a hilarious song that he'll sing at well many but one that he wrote that he'll sing at the end so it kind of combines stand up and music but um what i do is totally different i mean i know people there so i'm kind of just having a conversation if i get stuck you know i can sing a song or something the thought of doing a stand up routine is terrifying so i said greg that's the nicest compliment i've ever gotten but no thank you <laughs> Although maybe I should, you know, walk towards your fear, you know what they say. So you never know, maybe one day I'll do it and try to get through, you know, yeah. one night. But I just think um, it could be the most horrific experience in the world. Yeah, I agree with you. <laughs> if somebody like heckled you or something, it's, it's different if you could start singing a song, but if they're heckling you and you have to keep talking, oh my gosh, <laughs> I have a great need to be liked. So that would be um, probably send me under my bed for about a month. <laughs> I think you have a have to be tougher than I am, you know, to do that. <laughs> Some things I can be, not that. <laughs> so I have a great admiration for it. I was gonna show like here here's you doing a product demo. I want to see that. Oh my gosh, it's <laughs> on your site, so I'm assuming. Yes. It's oh no, it's fine. Hi. It's old. Coming to you from sunny, warm Sherman Oaks, California today. <laughs> and I'm here to talk to you about one of my favorite products. This is the Laura Geller Baked Body Frosting. <laughs> it's one of my hacks. That I was a theater arts major, so I took the required theater classes. I also did some modeling in Florida and New York, and I worked with some wonderful makeup artists and got a lot of tips from them. <laughs> Mostly, I buy a lot of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's funny right there <laughs> okay all right this is good but i i think i would like to see your music and stuff so, um, so we already saw boots are made for while yeah i think i sent you the one where um we had this great night at the open mic recently with um uh andy langham was playing leo amuedo stopped by dory was there um Bruce Lett was on bass and Leo's son, uh, Danilo Amuedo, who is an incredible drummer who just recently moved here from Brazil uh -huh. was playing. And um, so I thought I had a, a different opening number planned and I thought, well, I'm not doing that <laughs> when I have these. So I, I brought Leo up and right. Leo and Dory both played on uh, Opato. Was this on uh, WhatsApp? That's the WhatsApp, yeah. Okay, so okay. So it was cool. We had two guitars and um, piano bass drums. Yeah. That was like a fun moment. And this is one of my favorite songs. This one right here, right? Two, yeah. Two. This one or this no, one? No, uh, the one below is the one with all of them. The one above is just the first time Leo came. Okay, and um, let's see. Did I. Uh... <laughs> Wait a minute. I know I can do this. Hello. Maybe just double click it. No, I've, I'm already. Oh. It. Maybe I'm downloading it and I don't even know it. Am I downloading it? Uh, no, I am not. Let's see. Oh, there it goes, I think. There's the play button. I see the play button showed up now. There we go. I'm in heaven right now. So as I make it through. <laughs> I'm in front of you. <laughs> yeah. Oh my lord, they sound so good. 
Lift up with dancing by the water. Quack, quack, quack. The rhythm made him think he ought to quack, quack, quack. He was dancing to the samba, the samba, the samba. Oh, goose, so. The goose was gay to pass him by. Honk, honk, honk. He stopped and gave the dance a try. Honk, honk. Fussing over, he was dancing. A new thing, a new swing. The lovely swan swam by in all her majesty. Then she loosened up. Coochie, coochie, coo to that swan. She joined the duck and goose and did the samba too. You should have seen the kind of samba she could do. They did the samba so long, they all fell right in the water. While well, they were swinging away, quack, 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 quack,
<laughs> My cutoff didn't work. <laughs> Sometimes it doesn't. Right? <laughs> they were grooving. <laughs> we were having a good time. <laughs> it was so... Um, Oh my gosh, what a what, we are so lucky to have that kind of caliber musicians and I was just in heaven and Leo played part of the night and then I had them do another instrumental and he and Dory played and it was wonderful and Dory always says if I practiced I could have been Leo but Leo talks about what a, an amazing musician he is so it was really quite something quite yeah. a night <laughs> we're very we're very lucky to have an abundance of amazing musicians here isn't it the truth i mean really i know that's why people move here you know because of that but i didn't i didn't think about that when i first moved here but it's just a blessing yeah a real blessing yeah, pretty, pretty crazy pretty pretty wonderful and that is one of your signature songs it has become you know it's very funny when i when i first started kind of doing the more cabaret style one of my signature songs was um ain't nobody here but us chickens Oh, so apparently I do poultry songs. <laughs> when somebody called this my signature song, I'm like, what is it about the poultry? <laughs> but yeah, this song, I'm just, I remember going to the old Catalina and hearing somebody do it and going, where is the album with that song on it? And, and, when, and she did the English lyrics as well. So, you know, eventually I'll learn the Portuguese one, but you know, one song in Portuguese wears me out. Like, oh my gosh give me two years to recover and then i'll do another one <laughs> i know i know the feeling i was just last night i was i was going over some music that i'm working on uh fixing vocals on recording and one is a beautiful ballad in portuguese and i was listening to it and you know i know i know what the words mean and so i'm really i'm thinking well that I need I need to breathe right there. I I had connected those words, and I would never do that in English. Ah, uh. you know, I I need to take a breath there, you know. So, but it's um you know a lot of work. What is it called? Which one are you doing? Louisa. Oh, I don't know it. It's a gorgeous uh, ballad by Jobim. Mm. Uh, absolutely gorgeous. Like, oh it's just great. oh that is beautiful melody yeah it's really beautiful and you know mitchell long right yes but he's playing on it too and uh he's probably gonna sing a little bit of harmony with me and uh it's just <laughs> oh that's yeah i've gotten to work with him a couple of times it was really nice but um Wow, that's beautiful. It's it's such a difficult language, which I didn't realize. I assumed it would be a little bit like Spanish. <laughs> like, and I went. I was working, um, luckily, with Jane Monheit, who, um, you know, has worked with Ivan a lot, and um, she wrote out everything phonetically for me. And then I went to a Portuguese teacher a couple of times to make sure that I understood, you know, what I was saying, and also to um, just practice it a little bit. She was funny because she said, "Of course, I learned." Ivan's pronunciation, which is he's from yeah. Rio. Yeah. And um, she said, you sound like you're from New York and I sound like I'm from Texas. Because <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize that there was such a distinct, you know, accent. I had heard about it, but I didn't, you know, really realize. And, but yeah. she said, it's fine. You know, if that's the way you've learned it. And that's that's all I can do is do. Yeah. It is. A, it's a yummy language. But I mean, you know, Girl from Ibanema, I think, was the first Portuguese song I learned. The difference between singing English and Portuguese, you know, you know, tall and tan and young, you know, <laughs> I mean, it's just juicy, you know. Oh my gosh, when you do that, it really makes me realize how well it was written to go with the music. I mean, you can see the yeah. difference. It's so musical and lyrical. Yeah. I did it on, um, I think I picked the the hardest song ever to do it on anyway. I did it on a song called Rio de Mayo. And um, it's a hard song anyway, because it's got the strangest bridge. It's like it's three part bridge or something. And so alone, if it had been English, I would have had a hard time with it. But then trying to do the Portuguese on top of it. And I, I took it to um, Todd Hunter who played it for me and I was working on it. He goes, oh, this is so pretty. Um, can I keep it? And I said, sure. And then um, the next thing you know, he's on his way to brazil to record with teo lima 
and Yvonne leans and I'm like, I get so mad that I am not there. <laughs> <laughs> but he had already worked with him. Um, they played a benefit. It was very funny. He tells a very funny story. Um, it, I think it was through Dion. He was playing a benefit. And so he was playing for Yvonne and Yvonne didn't know what to do. And he said, well, what about this? And he started playing love dance and Yvonne goes, oh, that's beautiful. What is it? Because <laughs> <laughs> he's so it's prolific that I'm sure he just didn't even remember <laughs> for a moment that he wrote it or wow. didn't recognize it for yeah, some reason. Yeah, isn't that funny? Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure it probably happens a lot because it, but he's just, um, those melodies that he writes, I could just wrap myself up in them. I yeah. mean, they're just beautiful. Well, the thing, uh, you know, I mean, there, yeah, there's so many great writers, but uh, like Jobim is kind of outstanding in a lot of his. Uh, har- I, it's not easy. It's not hard for me to think why he was he was so famous like throughout his career. But uh, like you'll hear a melody that is seemingly so simple, but the harmonics are moving in the background. Like uh, <clears throat> um, what's this song? Um, it's a uh, uh, let's see, what's the song I did? I I recorded it on a, on a CD of mine. Uh, let me Not just. Triste de Savenado, none of the like. No. Regular old ones. Is... I have to go look for it. Let me see. Can I see it that way? Oh, Zingaro. Ah. Uh, you know that one? Mm-mm. <clears throat> oh, here, here's the melody, how it starts. <clears throat> Uh, let's see. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> oh, okay. Ba 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 da do da. Ba 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 do ba 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 ba. It's like repeating, right? The same melody, but the harmony is changing in the background. Oh so wow! When you listen to the song itself, you're like, oh my god, you know, because the harmony. And, you know, of course, you know, I always tell my students that jazz is two things. One is um, playing with rhythm and the other is uh, how the note that you're singing uh, blends with the chord that's being played. That's why when you phrase in jazz, you know, when you shift the sentence, it becomes something else because now the note, instead of being with this chord, is now with this chord and it has a different tension. And um, so that's what show me does it's like right. oh my god so beautiful and his melodies you they are deceptively simple but they're beautiful and they they're the it's that thing that they say about writers can you leave humming it yes you're going to be forever going dun, 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 you know it's just constant you know that that there's no way that you're not going to be humming that you know when somebody sings it it's just beautifully done yeah and i like i think maybe that's why Astrid's sound worked so well with that. It was just, you know, she didn't do a lot. You don't, you don't need to do a lot to it. You know, there's... Well, she was, she did kind of under, <laughs> under. <laughs> you know, I remember when my sisters and I went to see her finally, you know, we had been singing Girl from Ipanema for, you know, a few years and we went and saw her. We were all excited and we were like, oh my God, she's so boring. <laughs> No, she got up. No facial expression. Uh, and ten and yeah. uh, definitely meant for a studio. You know, isn't it interesting though? Because um, I was thinking the other day, one one of the first people that I saw, jazz singer, when I started um, singing again, it was one of the most phenomenal performances I've ever seen, and to this day I remember it. And to this day, I wish I had just bought the CD and stayed home because it was, she wasn't a performer. She was an incredible vocalist and incredibly skilled, but um, not a lot of subtext, first of all. And the, and the show itself was, I just wanted to take the CD home and listen to it. Um, so I think there was some, if there hadn't been any subtext, even in the CD, I would have not been interested in it, but the skill, she did a vocalese on a, on an instrumental that was just amazing. And I just wanted to hear how she did it again. Then there's the other people that you go and I would think, oh my gosh, this is the most fascinating performer. I never need to hear them again. I would not buy a CD unless it's just to get an autograph because I like them, but I'm not going to listen to it. And then there's the few that are a combo of the two. And that's the, 
that's the hard to find, you know, that are really good vocalists and also incredibly entertaining. Yeah. You didn't get to go to the Nancy Smith show last week, right? No, I was there. Yeah. Oh, you were? I was. Did we say hello? I don't know. I don't think so. Anyway, that was a great show and the singers were all so wonderful, right? I loved um having a lot of different types of of vocalists. Um yeah. it was you know, it's, it's so it's so interesting to me. It's always fascinated me how subjective it is and who speaks to you as a vocalist and who doesn't. And I was just reading about um, Billie Eilish. In fact, I think I posted it that she sounds she says she sounds like a parody of herself when she listens to herself young. And I don't know, she was probably doing that what they call that indie girl voice, which people which I'm I got tired of everybody trying to sound like Amy Winehouse and I got tired of um, that baby girl voice, which I think um, uh, at first it's like, oh, this is cool. And then after a while, it's funny. Women, I think, go, ew, that's, you know, and men go, oh, that's very cool. So it's so subjective, you know, not only between men and women, but vocals. And, you know, there's there's vocalists that you think nobody's going to say Elle is bad. There's no way you could say Elle is bad. She's brilliant. But there are still people that know she's brilliant, but maybe don't want to listen to her. And that always fascinates me. You know, like, who's the voice that speaks to you and why? And why does it, is it pleasing to my ear and not somebody else's? Yeah, I agree with you about that little weird little voice that Billy and, you know, so many people, when people show up, like, as students with that voice, it's like, oh, boy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's what's selling. So everybody wants to imitate it because and, and I read this question too, like, why does everybody sound like this? Well, that's the popular sound. And unfortunately, if somebody I like distinctive voices, but if somebody has one, then everybody starts to imitate it. And it's like, that's not good. You, you know, you need to sound like yourself. And it fascinated me because I saw this girl doing a video of how to do that, like the scoop and the crack and the and the thing that was so distinctive to these voices, but but why does everybody want to sound the same? I mean, they already have people like that. You're not gonna, it's not gonna get you any more work, I guess, unless maybe you can sound like them in the studio, you know, or something. But yeah, yeah I mean, I think it's interesting. I like people that have a very distinctive voice. I also like people, I think the difference sometimes in a singer, a good vocalist who's very skilled it's just that a good vocalist who's very skilled and i listen to them and i go they're very skilled they clearly are well trained sounds great nobody could ever say that it doesn't but then maybe the judy garland or the person who's more flawed or the person who's exactly the same as that person who maybe is imitating it but has lived a life where they have some experiences and they don't have to be old you know a young person can have those experiences or at the very least know how to tap into what it would feel like to have those experiences or relate to something that gives them the same emotion in while they're singing the song when somebody has a subtext it's a completely different performance than just a skilled vocalist and i always kind of try to prove the point to somebody when you see a person that forgets their lyrics that expression deer in headlights that we all get on our faces like all of a sudden I can't remember one English word that I ever learned my entire life and I'm just seeing a blank white board there's no the subtext there is fear <laughs> but it's also blank and you can see it and yeah. and if you think about those moments as opposed to somebody who's either joyfully enjoying what they're singing or is is mentally gone to the place of that ballad you know that to me makes a huge difference in the those are the people that I like to see. Yeah, me too. Well, I think I to me it's like it's you have to be honest, and that that's what I like. I don't care if your voice is perfect or not. I actually want the honesty more, the honest t uh, telling of your feelings. But that is a very elusive uh, thing to reach, actually, when you're singing. Right. Maybe when you're talking, you're fine doing that, uh, you know, with your friends or your family or whatever. But when you're singing, when you're up in front of people or with the band and you're, you know, thinking of music and all this stuff, being honest is and being OK with being honest, you know, 
because there's so many things going on. You're like, oh, so-and-so just came in. I have to get them up next. Or, (laughs) oh, what was that chord they just played? Uh, Wait, I'm lost. Or what, you know, there's so many things going through our minds. But if we, when you can get into that zone, either of that, you know, that groove or the zone of, I like to play like a little mini movie in my head. You know, if it's a ballad where I don't have to, um, you know, if I can just focus for a minute, you know, on the ballad and listen to what they're playing, but also have that little mini movie running of, I always tend to pick songs that are sort of in the place where I am at the moment too, if I'm just singing like a song or two at the open, well, the open mic, I have to do an opening up tempo, but then closing, I usually sometimes do that. But then I also go, oh, it's been sort of a depressing night. Let me do these boots are made for walking <laughs> instead of the one I really want to do. <laughs> Let's pull everybody out of this mood or try. That I feel like is really our job too, as entertainers is to, um, let people come escape for a little bit yeah. and and my job is to entertain you to let you escape and to hopefully help you have a good time yeah i i remember you know i'm sure that we've seen we've both seen certain things uh, and people get up like we were talking about you know issues of driving or whatever um yeah one of the things that always fascinated me at the jam session was if the singer got up, no matter how good they were, if they didn't, if they weren't aware of the musicians, like if they weren't listening to the music, the band actually sounded less than great. And when they were aware of the band and were listening, uh, no matter how how low on the totem pole they were, the band sounded great. And that mm-hmm. always fascinated me. You know, you could I, I could see the singer listening or not listening. Right. It's all about me or no, it's about the whole group, you know. And um, so that, you know, that's one. That is fascinating and something I hadn't thought of. I think um, sometimes fear takes over yeah. because, you know, you'll listen to like a recording later and you're like, oh, they did that. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes if you're terrified yeah. it's hard to hear you know what's going on i think that that's a skill level that you have reached to when you because you interact with the musicians so much and you improvise with them and you respond to what they're doing and that um that takes a long time to get to that point i think when because it's well it's hard I, it's just fear i think we i was lucky i don't know about you did this but i mean i used to work 10 gigs a week you know um, what I mean? In the days that we were all, you know, we were working a lot, 70s, 80s, you know. And um, so I was lucky because I got to make mistakes and I got to I got to learn. And, it, you know, all those gigs and people nowadays, what, they get up at a jam session and sing one song a, a week? Yeah, you know, how that's can, hard. How can they accomplish all that, you know? Yeah, you're absolutely right. That's like the big band singers of the day. They'd get bored singing the same song and they'd improvise. And, you know, Garden Cafe has been huge for me that way to be able to do a couple of hours or Urban Press with Linda to be able to do like three hours and do it over and over consistently. And and it also, you know, I used to think you got what you got. You, it doesn't really improve, but it really does. You know, the muscle and the more you use it, the better it gets. But but it's true, it is really difficult to to do that unless you get that experience, you know, learning with people, but. Yeah, um, Linda's mentioning Gail Larone, who is to me great. I mean, she, you know, she's phenomenal. A, you know, singer and entertainer, able to. In a major way. Something that falls down like, like that. <clears throat> she's so amazing and. Hilarious. She reminds me I mean, she knows how I feel about her singing, but she reminds me of singers that I heard like in the late 60s, early 70s. There were these singers that were, can't remember names right now, but they were, they were, po- they were popular. They were maybe pop or Broadway theater or, you know, they were singers. You paid money and you went to see a show. You know, it was like a, you know, maybe they played in Vegas or I don't wherever, but <clears throat> she has that kind of a voice that it's like Dion Warwick used to be like that. You know, it was this really distinct personality, you know, yep. really beautiful and a very high level um, of quality. And yeah, she's, 
Gail Leron is really she's phenomenal funny one of the sweetest people ever Linda's like that though I remember the first time I heard Linda sing I was like what a voice yeah. I love her voice and she's funny and entertaining the two of them together oh my gosh they have this whole routine that they it's oh I know you've seen it it's hilarious <laughs> speaking of 10 gigs a week to uh, Tamir Hendelman I'm sure you've probably heard him tells the funniest story about you when he did a master class that I was musical masters we were doing and he said that um he was trying to get a gig in town and he asked you to sing on for, for something where he was playing with the singer and he gave the cassette <laughs> to the, the the bar restaurant or whatever it was and um the guy was like oh yeah it sounds great can you tell me how to get in touch with that singer because <laughs> they needed a singer and they wanted you they didn't need a piano player it was so funny i don't remember exactly how he tells it but it was cute it was ca del sol oh is that it <laughs> yes and marty um marty uh no my names are really going out of my head marty something or other he was like a, a well-known piano player at the time but uh kind of weird because <laughs> <laughs> He would kind of phone it in a lot. Anyway, he, I, I, I can't remember exactly what happened, but I remember that I, I ended up working with Marty there, but then later I started booking there. And um, so I, and then Tamir and I worked a lot together there. Um, so, but yeah, that was, <laughs> I thought that was such a funny story. And I'm like, what, what happened to those days too? Nobody needs singers now. They all looking for piano players and, and, and musicians. <laughs> well, you gotta go. You gotta go out there, you know, and look. I I keep thinking I really should just, you know, go out to places and talk to people and, and get a few gigs, you know. But I'm I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> and we we also started that that you know, now they have to have like the right license and you know all of that stuff too. It's different, but yeah, I hear you. If we've all gotten used to staying home too, which is yeah. I blame the name for getting too on the pandemic too, because after the, somebody said to me after the pandemic, I remember getting ready to promote something and I thought, oh my gosh, I know four people with the same first name. I'm not sure if I'm putting the right last name and I had to go on Facebook to make sure with the, the picture was the name I was using. And people said, because we're not having conversations with people where we say, oh, did you see Kathy Siegel Garcia the other day? Or did you see Linda A. Smith the other day? We're not saying people's names. So they just <laughs> evaporate. <laughs> They left. <laughs> so I'm still blaming that. <laughs> well, that's, that's a kind explanation, I think. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sure it's related to something else, but that's what I'm saying. I'm sticking with it. <laughs> well, Carrie Kelsey, this has been two hours. Oh my gosh, that flew by. See, you didn't think you had anything to say, right? <laughs> <laughs> I was pretty sure I did. <laughs> Uh, well, what so what fun for, thanks so much for being here it was really fun to hang out thank you for having me as your five millionth guest you're, you're number 495 <laughs> 495 that's a good number, that's a, nice number. <laughs> that's a lot of people Kathy that's a lot of work see what I mean about the things that you that you came up with and did that's a lot of lot of of work I'm gonna I'm, um, I'm 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 uh, well the 500th day i i actually booked somebody not thinking but the 501st day i have a special show planned so oh uh, cool yeah, it's gonna be fun but um 500 so thank you so much yeah. for having me it was absolutely delightful and thank you to all my f fabulous buds that that stopped by they definitely showed up i'm so um, glad and uh tomorrow i'm i actually am having my friend come here she wants to she she said can i come over and do it and i said absolutely so <laughs> she's coming her name's ellen burr and she's really a great flutist and she plays all different things she reads her ass off but she also is a great impro improviser and um so um, oh, i heard you talking about her yesterday in the interview yesterday i almost asked if i could come over because i was scared of the technology <laughs> well, anybody who's, you know, yeah, you can come over. But I put my tree up. <laughs> uh, it does look here. <laughs> the side of the room is great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Kathy. I adore you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. And so you can see Carrie every Tuesday at the Gardenia. And, uh, tonight, too? Not, yeah, tonight. 
And, and uh, not this Friday, but the following Friday, she's going to start again on um, every two weeks at the Garden Cafe. And tomorrow night, actually, I'm subbing for Patrick Barnett doing an open okay. mic at the Urban Press. Yeah. Cool. And then I think I'm going to guest sing with him on Saturday at the conference room. So this is a, a busy week on, on wow. Saturday. I'll do that. Yeah, he's it's his gig, but he invited me to come sing. So how nice I might do. I know it's very nice of him. So and then the next week I'll be at Garden. So there's a few places I'm, I'm not even close to what you're doing, but I'm out there a little bit. You're doing a lot. You're doing a lot. Yeah. It's fun. Thank you. This is, you just look beautiful, by the way. I love those colors. Thank you. I, yeah, I'm, I'm like, oh, it's, that's, that's it. Like a snuggly. I need a snuggly. <laughs> all right, ladies and gentlemen, love you all. See you tomorrow. And, you know, Thursday through Sunday, there'll be archives. So you can always come back. Bye. Bye, honey.